any of them. But it's really the heart behind the methods that we're doing to reach people with the message of Christ. I can tell you, man, there's been some people that I've met. I'll never forget. I was in Tennessee. We did a whitewater rafting trip with the young adults. And our, our, our raft guide had on the color beads. And he started to, like, explain them to me. And you could catch the heart behind the method. You see, in this church with evangelism, it's more so about the heart behind the method. And allowing God to work through His Scripture and whatever unique ability He gives you to advance the gospel and the kingdom. And so we're not discrediting any of those. All of those are a form of evangelism. But I want to turn up the heart. And so our working definition this morning, if you're taking notes, is just something kind of studying through evangelism that I landed on these words. Evangelism, here's the definition that we're going with. Earnestly proclaiming the gospel to those who don't know Him. So that they may be given the opportunity... To know him. And so that's really kind of the heart behind evangelism as we unpack some things this morning. The heart behind evangelism is a heart that longs to see others come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Can I be honest with you? Probably some of the uh, worst, uh, maybe, publicity that the church gets against it is when someone is proclaiming the gospel with a heart that is not Christ centered. And so then it becomes an angry mob attacking people that are far from God. And then the, the, the press that comes back on that is that all Christians evangelize this way. And what we want to address is the heart. You know, there are people that are called to stand on street corners, to hold signs, to wear shirts, to leave pamphlets, but we have to identify the heart behind it. What does it say in the Word of God that they'll know that you're my disciples because of your love for one another, not your anger towards one another, not your wrath, your neighbor's sin, or whatever it might be. And so the emphasis for this is so much more of a heart issue than it is a method issue. The gospel, the good news that Jesus paid a price that we couldn't pay, that in our sin and shame, God saw sons and daughters whom he loved. He didn't wait for us to make the first move. He responded with grace when the move of Genesis 3 was the one that was the fall of man and his response was love, grace, mercy, forgiveness. And so really we want to catch the heart behind it. And so we can go all throughout the Bible and you know, look at examples and look at great evangelists in the Bible. We can look at you know, Paul who evangelizes and takes the church on a, just a mission stance and, and spreads it everywhere. But in my opinion, the greatest evangelist that we have to lean and to learn from is the greatest name that's in the Bible, and it's Jesus. Have you ever considered that, that when we talk about prophets, teachers, evangelists, missionaries, that Jesus is the one who was all of these things. He was the greatest teacher, the greatest preacher, the greatest evangelist. And so, really, I want to look at just a conversation that started, a very familiar conversation in John chapter 4 with a woman at the well. It was a Samaritan woman at the well. And really, the heart of evangelism that Jesus displays here is one of relationship. And he sits down and he has this conversation. The great appeal is the relational aspect of everything. So starting in a, verse 3, it says that he, Jesus, left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which would be 12 o'clock in the afternoon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, again, as we unpack your word and as we lean into your teachings and we learn from you, God, may it be directly from you. God, I submit all of my opinions and all of my study and everything that I've prepared to you and to you alone, God. May you speak in and through me so that it's your word spoken because we know that your word doesn't return void. God, we love you and it's in your name we say amen. So really, Jesus gives us some principles and he shows us evangelism in action 
in a conversation he started with a lady he never, he never should have talked to. Because when you look at kind of the history of the Jews and the Samaritans, see the Samaritans were kind of like a, like a half-bred person or a half-bred group of people that were kind of mixed races and things of that nature. And so the Jews and the Samaritans would stay separate because the Jews, ultimately salvation came from the Jews and it was for them and then mandated that it was spread to the Gentiles and Samaritans. And so Jesus takes this act into action and he starts a conversation with someone who was hurting, who was broken, who needed to hear the message of Christ and through his approach evangelistically reaching out, starting a conversation and entering into dialogue, this woman comes to discover who she in fact is speaking to. And so I just want to give you a few things that Jesus shows us when it comes to evangelism. And maybe those are some things that we can turn up in our own life as we look for opportunities. So here's the first thing that I pulled from that, is that Jesus shows us that evangelism, that it begins with a burden. If you're taking notes, evangelism, it begins with a burden. Well, how does it begin with a burden in this? Because in John 4, 4, it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Truth be told, he didn't have to pass through Samaria unless there was a conversation intentionally waiting for him at the well at 12 o'clock when no one else would have been at the well. He had to. There was a burden that he would have felt and that he would have taken on to allow someone else to experience the gospel, the saving message of Christ. And he did it at a well in the afternoon with a woman who was completely just distant from the rest of her village. You know, if you don't know the story, you can read and see that she had lived a life that really wasn't one worthy of talking about or, you know, standing as an example of someone who was doing things right. See, Jesus brought correction, and he brought some things to her attention that she needed to work through and she needed to work on, but he did it through this heart that I believe is the heart behind evangelism. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of times, man, we just mess up opportunities before they even happen because the heart behind it didn't start for a burden. Didn't start from a burden. See, Jesus had a burden for people that were hurt, that were lost, that were looking for more of him and didn't know him. And I'll be honest with you, man, if I could just be transparent for a moment, that there's been times where I've entered into a conversation and the burden that I felt was not someone's eternity. And so I didn't really approach it with eternal perspective. I approached it maybe out of frustration that I was feeling for the life that they were living and I wanted to bring correction before I brought relationship. And before I brought relationship and tried to bring correction, I missed an opportunity before it even started. And so what happens in this dialogue is that Jesus starts the conversation leading this woman to a place to come to the realization that there was so much more to the person she was talking to at the well. You know, I wonder as Christians and as Christ followers, as if someone engages in conversation with us normally at the workplace, at home, at school, wherever we might be, do people leave thinking there's so much more behind what they've just said? You know, like a lot of times, uh, uh, the crazy thing about the written word is sometimes it's absence of the it's absent of the emotion that's felt in the time. And so, uh, if we're trying to get a response for for scripture, we we try to read into things there. And so, like the "give me a drink," you know, we could we could kind of read into what that looked like. Was it like a a command, like "yo"? go to the kitchen, make me a sandwich type command. You know what I'm saying? Was it like, 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 give me a drink? See, I believe the appeal for Jesus' words were not the appeal of wrath and anger behind them. It was the heart of generosity and grace and forgiveness and mercy that he was going to extend. How do I know that? Because it says in the word that it's his loving kindness that leads to repentance. And so every word I read from Jesus, even with correction, I read it from the lens of his loving kindness behind every word. And so this give me a drink would have been just a place of engaging. I mean, he just said he was tired. <laughs> Give me a drink. So it begins with a burden. He had a burden for this woman. He had a burden for the people of Samaria, that they would come to know Christ and that he would be the forerunner for the extension of the gospel eventually, that, that God would call Paul to a group of people and a body of people that at one time he would, he would not have any doings with. He wouldn't do any life with the Gentiles, but now Paul is evangelizing and spreading the gospel. So it begins with a burden. Second thing is if you're taking notes, Jesus shows us that evangelism, that it's tactful. It's tactful. There was some tact behind it. Does anyone know what tact means? And so here's the deal. Like, like that's part of the words of Jesus saying to her, give me a drink. Like there was, 
there was some tact behind it. And so a tactful conversation is a conversation that allows dialogue to happen without making an enemy. In fact, Isaac Newton defines the word tact as the ability to make a point without making an enemy. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times we want to get into conversations with someone that's lost to make a point, but in doing so, we make an enemy. And if we make an enemy, there's no response to the gospel that we're trying to share. And so there was tact. There was something behind his method of evangelism that would say, you know what, I'm going to take the time to dialogue and to conversate. You know, there is the heart behind the street evangelist who's proclaiming the gospel on the corner that would, the, the correct heart behind that would draw someone into the saving knowledge of Christ because of the heart behind the evangelist. The evangelists that are most effective on the street corners are the ones that will take time to have conversation with someone after they just proclaim it. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I'm not against that. I don't want you to get caught up in methods this morning. It's more the message and the heart behind it. And so there was tact. Can I tell you, there's been a lot of times where I've missed opportunities because I wasn't tactful in my approach. You ready for me to step on toes? Pick up your feet. How tactful are we on our post on, on Instagram and on Facebook and on social media? <laughs> that was perfect timing. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Like, I could just imagine the tactfulness that would be into Jesus' post if he were living now and posting on social media. Can I tell you that with Christ alive in us, that we have the ability to represent Christ on all platforms, including social media, and the tactfulness and how we approach some of the biggest issues in this world can lead to someone being set free by the saving knowledge of Christ, not by the opinion of John, but by the conviction of the Holy Spirit that's ushered in behind the tactfulness of our words that we choose, allowing ourselves to engage in dialogue, follow up by coffee, and lead someone to Christ. Like, Do you get the tactfulness behind Jesus in all of his words? I mean, I was convicted in this because I was like, yo, sometimes, like, I'm the guy that thinks a lot about posts so that I can get the most response. You know what I'm saying? Like, there ain't no tactfulness behind that. That's strategy, baby. Like, I'm just trying to get a response. You know, like, tactfulness is waiting until the game's over before you declare your football team the victor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm silent at the beginning, bro. I ain't saying nothing at the Iron Bowl until it's done. Right? And then tactfulness just flies out the window. But anyways, <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? And so I, I guess I would say, even evangelistically speaking, that not just the spoken word and dialogue is an evangelistic tool. Truth be told, social media is probably one of the fastest spreading tools that we have. And so why don't we take advantage of the platform instead of destroy it? Man, I can just sit and think about how many people, how many of my friends... See, the investment before social media that we would put into relationships was a lot of time, right? <laughs> like, you, you had to go out of your way to go and spend time with a friend a couple hours down the road. You had to really, like, make those appointments count and stand for something. And so I've had friends, see, like, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older than Facebook. MySpace came out and was popping, you know what I'm saying? Anyone? MySpace? Hold up, let's take it even further back. AOL Instant Messenger? <laughs> what? It's when you, like, do your initials and a couple of cool numbers afterwards. <laughs> and so um, I say that to say this. I've spent time investing in a lot of friends' lives only for all the investments I've put in to be destroyed by one post in one moment of anger and bitterness from a Christian who was mad at the world. And it completely tore down work that we were putting into our friendships and in our relationships. So can I just say, like, an appeal for me, from my heart to yours, is as a church, a community known as Church at the Crossing, can we be tactful in our posts? Can we commit to that? And I have fun with posts, too. I'm not saying, like, tactfulness doesn't take fun out of it. I think we just think that if they're tactful, you can't have a sense of humor. No, you can have a great sense of humor. I mean, Jesus had an awesome sense of humor. I mean, he would just show up and his disciples wouldn't know who he was walking on water, right? Like, to me, that's kind of funny. Like, who's that on the water? Like, Jesus, why'd you do that? Like, come on, man. Why'd you just announce that you're there? Or like sitting, you know, in his resurrected state, sitting on the, on the shore when uh, the, the, uh, his disciples were fishing and he's got a campfire and he just yells out to him, you guys caught any fish? Who is that man on the shore? <laughs> like, why didn't you do the walk thing again? Why didn't you go out in the water and show him? But anyways, sense of humor is okay. You can have a, a sense of humor that has some tactfulness behind it. And so you don't have to lose that even in that. 
Next thing that Jesus shows us about evangelism is that Jesus is willing to have a conversation. I mean, I would ask you in your approach to trying to reach someone with the saving knowledge of Christ through your testimony and through your experience with Him, are you willing to have a conversation? Not a monologue. This is a monologue right now. I'm speaking to y'all. So I'm using like kind of crowd terms, right? Like people talk. Personal talk is a conversation that allows dialogue to happen where you engage in a conversation with tactfulness in mind. And you can actually sit across the table with someone that, guess what, disagrees with you and it's okay. You're like, it's okay. And we don't have to be so offended that we go on a rant and pick up all of our toys and leave the city we live in because our feelings got hurt. I'm so offended. I need a, I need a safe space. <laughs> I need to go sit in a corner away from everyone. So what I'm saying is, like, are we willing to allow a conversation to happen that potentially would just be a challenge to build a relationship with someone who, at the end of the day, like, needs to see the love of Christ poured out from someone who knows Christ? You know what I'm saying? Like, in that conversation, you're the one who's tactful. doesn't mean that they are. <laughs> You're the one that's patient. Doesn't mean that they are. You're the one who exercises an amount of grace and mercy and forgiveness. Doesn't mean that they do. And when we can understand that we approach it with the power of Jesus through the Holy Spirit inside of us, the coolest thing is is that you don't even have to speak. He'll speak for you. That's the greatest thing that could ever happen is that you would silence your own opinion and say, God, when I speak, let it be your heart. When I speak, let it be your voice. When I speak, let them see you. Because I don't want them to fall in love with John. I want them to fall in love with Jesus. And the only way that can happen is if you speak in and through me. And the greatest tool that I have for that is, oh, look at this. It's the word of God. <laughs> like I can lead them to this. And I can allow God to speak. Why? Because again, like we've said time and time before, this book lives and it breathes and it speaks and God's promises in this word are still just as relevant today as they were thousands of years ago that it's still alive that it's still speaking well John how do you know because in Genesis it said then God said and he created and last I checked we're still evolving we're still here like revolving the world is moving and everything's happening and so he's still speaking so why don't we just sit down have you ever just had the thought to sit down and have conversation and instead of like our study of study of study, just take them straight to the word. Well, you know, so-and-so says, okay, what does Jesus say? You know, I heard a, a great scholar, a great theologian, a great proclaimer of the gospel say that one day someone's going to pick up this word, read everything it says and believe everything in it and put us all to shame. Because a lot of times we run to the safety of our theological studies in our books and we leave the source of life. Like, I love great men that went before me and that studied the Word of God with reverence and that would approach it by praying for hours and hours before they would even open up the Word of God. I love the Internet that gives me quick access to their study so I don't have to go through millions of books. But at the end of the day, does it line up with what the Word of God says? And I tell you, on just part of discipleship and even evangelism, I feel like I have to say this. Not everyone who proclaims to be a Christian and a preacher preaches the Word of God. And then we have people buying into a false message of hope that never existed because the realization that we were lost and hurting was never found because we never allowed this book to speak. So let it speak before you do. Have some tactfulness behind it. Be willing to have a conversation. Jesus was willing to have that conversation. A dialogue, not a monologue. Here's the deal with conversation. Sometimes the best thing you can do is listen to the hurt that's sitting across the table. I've met with some people, man, that are just hurting. And a lot of it is because of where they're at socially speaking or economically speaking or even like gender speaking or, or, or racially speaking. Whatever it might be, I've got friends that are hurting. And they just want to be heard in a conversation. And the greatest thing is when they reveal the hurt, we can reveal the healing. See, don't jump to the conclusion before it's never reached. Here's the thing, and I had a conversation with an amazing student this past week. And we talked about discovery and discovering things. And when they discover something, we can teach along the way of their discovery. I was talking with her and I said, you know, uh, what is uh, the three formulas from math last year in school that you learned? You know what she said? 
I mean, I know there's addition and multiplication, but what are you talking about? I was like, what's the quadratic? Like, like I don't know. Is that called an equation? Yo, I don't even, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, I just showed my hands. <laughs> John, you don't even know math. <laughs> <laughs> but it was cool because like the point was okay what's your favorite subject and she said art I said awesome who showed you how to draw she said well no one she said well now let me take that back like I I had a passion for it and so I started and then I started to like find teachers that would help this discovered potential that I found and I said look here's the deal if it's taught to you you forget it if you discover it you'll die for it You'll spend the rest of your life in it. And so what I want to do as a pastor is I want to help you discover Jesus and allow teaching to happen along the way. Because a lot of times when we teach without the approach of discovery, they'll forget everything that we say in a conversation. And so to have this dialogue with this student who understood, wow, that's why I love art, because I discovered it. And then I leaned into teaching. We want people to discover Jesus first, come to a church and say, okay, what's my next step? It's the heart of discipleship, right? Someone who gets saved and then is looking for whatever's next. As a church, we're committing to having next steps in place. If you're saved, awesome. Have you ever been water baptized? Because that's a public confession of faith, and we can do that as a church with you. We'd love to celebrate publicly what God did personally and privately, and we'll proclaim the gospel, and the enemy's going to know that he lost when you publicly show your faith. Like, we're good with that. Awesome. Yeah, I've been water baptized. Cool. Are you in a, any, like, are you studying the word of God? Have you, have you, have you jumped into the Bible? Have you, like, 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 what do you know? Have you started in Matthew? Have you started in John? Have you started in Romans? Where are you in the Bible? Oh, I just read this book, this book, that book. Okay, put all those aside. Start in the word of God. And then let's discover together. Get what I'm saying? It's the heart behind it. And so there's a burden that starts with it. There's tactfulness. Then he's willing to have a conversation. And finally, and I'm closing right here, is that Jesus shows us that evangelism it gives someone the opportunity to experience his grace and forgiveness for the first time. As simple as that sounds, I want you to catch the heart behind it. It gives someone the opportunity to experience his grace and his forgiveness for the first time. If you've been saved for quite some time, do you remember the first time that you experienced that grace? Do you remember the first time that you experienced that forgiveness? Do you remember the first time that you experienced his mercy? That instead of giving us what we deserved, he gave us out of his loving heart and out of a debt that his son paid on a cross. I mean, the truth is, is he didn't give us what we deserved. He gave us better. Realize that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I said earlier, man, he made the first move to open up the doors and the windows of forgiveness to usher in the presence of grace and mercy. Man, I remember when I truly understood forgiveness. Because I was a kid that grew up going to church my whole life. I probably got saved 14 times every summer going to summer camp. <laughs> Sometimes it was to get a book. Sometimes it was, it was one church, man, that gave out cookies and drinks after you got saved, so ya boy. <laughs> Yo, they had four services. I went to every one. <laughs> I got saved and ate chocolate chips. But uh, <laughs> I remember the first moment that I truly understood and appreciated his forgiveness and realized what he did for me. So it was that moment that's that sealed forever my place in eternity with him in heaven. I remember the first time that I, I, I felt like, I, I, let me say this about his grace, I don't fully understand it. Why would he give what I don't deserve? I had a good conversation with a friend this past week. And we were talking about how we, as humans, we understand cause and effect, right? Like there's an effect. Something caused it. It's almost like God's given me this picture of His grace that it's just the effect. I mean, He loves us regardless of what we've done. But He loves us enough not to leave us in what we're lost in. To bring correction and conviction through the Holy Spirit. And truth be told, if we look at grace, 
The message of grace isn't this greasy, hyperactive message that says I can live how I want, do what I want. It's a message that completely connects me to the heart of God. You know, I'll never forget, man. Yeah, maybe this is one of your things that you'll have to sit on your opinion. Because I don't know what you're going to think about this statement I'm about to make. When I was 22 years old, it was the hardest year of my life when my wife left me. Man, I was so mad at God. So I was like, God, you called me in the ministry. And where I'm serving, because I've walked through this, there's no way I'll ever be on a microphone. There's no way that I would ever proclaim the gospel. So God, you missed the call on my life. And I walked through a dark season, man. There was a year and a half that I don't even remember about my life because I was so depressed. Can I say this? If you've never struggled with depression, you don't know the hurt behind it. If you've never struggled with anxiety, and you look at someone who has, you're trying to make sense of something you've never experienced. Man, people were just telling me all the time, like, yo, John, life goes on, get over it. But in the moment, I just needed someone to show up and have a conversation with me and let me hurt. And I'll never forget, man, I went through this restoration and healing process with my best friends in the world, a guy named Jerry Brown half Korean, half black, craziest dude you'll ever meet. <laughs> you'll eat bulgogi and fried chicken in the same day. Like, it was amazing. It was so much fun. But Jerry was this, this covered Jonathan broken moment thing that I needed. And he walked me through the hurt and was like, yo, John, like, God's call on your life, it doesn't come with regret. Like, he didn't take that thing back. And so, like, he really kind of just restored joy. And so I experienced forgiveness and, and, and restoration in that. And then I moved to Alabama. And November 29th will be nine years that I've been married to the picture of grace in my life. I'll never forget when I married Brandy. My dad did the ceremony and he walks in and, and he says, John, are you good? I was like, what? No, I'm not good, Dad. I said, Dad, I understand it now. This is the second chance. This is the grace that I never understood until you gave me what I didn't deserve because I didn't deserve her. She was the one that on paper did everything right. I was the one on paper that did everything wrong. It wouldn't have made sense if not for grace. And so from that day forward, I was like, wow, God, you truly do give second chances. You're the God of second chances, of 300 chances. God, that your grace would draw us into a place that would allow us to live free because it's the Holy Spirit that convicts. And here's the deal. The aim of evangelism is always eternity. It is always eternity. It's not about in the moment. It's about the moment and eternity. And so when we approach it with the heart of Jesus, Jesus had a conversation with this woman at the well. And he wasn't just okay with her current situation. And he wanted to make sure that the rest of her life would be spent in unbroken fellowship with Him. You see, eternity isn't just about getting out of hell and going to heaven. Eternity is about being in an unbroken relationship with Christ. How do we know this? Because the Word of God gives us this amazing picture. We get to eavesdrop on a conversation between Jesus, the Son, and God, the Father. In John 17, there's a prayer. And Jesus says in this prayer, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Did you catch what Jesus said to his Father? He didn't just say, this is eternal life, that they'll be in heaven forever. He said, this is eternal life, that they would know you. And that know, the Greek word there, is an intimate knowledge of Christ. It's a relationship with God that is never broken. That's eternity. That's the picture of salvation here and now, is that we get to be in that relationship here and in eternity. 
And Jesus tells us this in his prayer. And he gives us this opportunity to be in unbroken relationship with him. Are you thankful that the greatest evangelist named Jesus took time, not just for a woman at the well, but for people sitting in Dothan, Alabama this morning? Are you thankful that his grace has always been enough? Are you thankful that it's his mercy and his loving kindness that leads to repentance? And I tell you this, God's really stirred in my heart. Next week, turn up the volume. It was going to be generosity. We can talk about that with Thanksgiving. We're going to turn up the volume on forgiveness and repentance next week. Don't shy away from that one. Bow your heads with me this morning.